In this lecture, I'm going to take you through differential educational achievement by class, but focusing in on the internal factors that influence educational achievement. Now, in the previous lecture, we looked at the trends in social class and achievement and identified that the working class in general underperformed compared to their middle class counterparts. And we looked at the various external factors and combining them into material deprivation, cultural deprivation and cultural capital. Now, some of those will come into the internal factors as well, particularly something like language codes and um, cultural capital. But what we're looking at here is really the roles and processes in education and how they will impact educational achievement according to class. So it might be an idea if, if you feel the need to go back to that lecture, go back to your notes on roles and processes in education and just remind yourself of what those are before we start applying them to um, educational achievement by class. Now, when it comes to the internal factors which affect educational achievement by class, they can be broken down into three main areas. Now, there are lots of different factors, but these we, we kind of grouped them together in order to ensure that um, it makes a little bit more sense rather than going through 101 different factors by grouping them together it makes it a little bit easier to manage so we're going to be looking firstly at teacher expectations and this really looks at the classroom teacher the roles and processes in schools and how they affect educational achievement by class we're also going to be looking at subcultures looking at pro and anti-school subcultures and how they relate to edu educational achievement by class and finally, we're looking at education policies. Now, as I said before, when we're looking at internal factors, internal means education um, system, not individual schools. And when we're looking at educational achievement, we're mainly focusing on GCSE level and A level, not really key stage two or lower. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is teacher expectations. And what we mean here by teacher expectation is how does the interaction between student and teacher, between student and school, influence educational achievement by class? So the first thing we're going to look at is labelling theory. Now, we've talked before about how there are lots of different factors which affect the labels that are attached to students. And there's a pr labelling process and a label is not an automatic self-fulfilling prophecy. We talked about how it can be preconceived ideas about students that uh, in what Hargreaves referred to as the speculation phase. It can be in-class behaviour in what he, uh, Hargreaves referred to as the elaboration and then the internalisation after the negotiation phase which leads to stabilisation of the label. And the sort of things we're talking about here that, that create these preconceived ideas are things like um, prior data, um, the um, reputation of a student, the reputation of family members of that student. But it's also things like, uh, in terms of the elaboration phase, it's also things like not turning up with equipment, uniform not being correct. Um, students who um, don't do their homework, things like that, that all create this label. And Becker said that um, the, these teacher interactions and these teacher-student interactions create an ideal pupil, the, the, the mould, if you like, of what a teacher is looking for in terms of the students in their lesson. Now, generally, schools will have a, an, a, a school based view. Every subject is slightly different, so there, there may be more subject based um, ideal pupils as well. If you remember back to our previous lecture on roles and processes, Hempel Jorgensen suggested that this ideal pupil um, varies depending on the socioeconomic background of the school. So, a school where discipline is a problem, where it's more a deprived area, 
that sort of school, their ideal pupil is more likely to be quiet, passive and obedient. But a school that's more middle class, more affluent in nature, that has few disciplinary problems, their ideal student is more likely to be defined by personality, by academic ability and by their engagement in wider school activities than it is by behaviour. And as I said, this label can also be linked to individual teacher expectations. So for example, my expectation of what I would expect from a student in PSHE is different to what I expect from a student in sociology. What I expect from a year seven is different to what I expect from a year 12. That's not to say we don't see similar behaviours in both. Um, but um, those sort of things will, will shape the labels that I give the students and shape the impression that I get of that student. And subconsciously, that can lead to differing um, levels of help, different level, level, um, differing levels of support in the classroom um, and differing levels of behaviour. OK, so this kind of labelling, what we see is working class students tend to be labelled labeled more negatively than middle class students because they don't necessarily fit that ideal pupil um, framework, if you like. And what you see, and this kind of links back again to the external factor of working class subcultures and Sugarman's ideas, of habitats and Bordeaux's ideas of habitats, that when the behaviours of those external subcultures are seen in school and they don't match that ideal pupil framework, they're seen as you, you get that kind of symbolic violence where um, students are told that they're not good enough, that they're not that the, the way that they're um, putting themselves out there isn't appropriate. And that can be linked to that um, symbolic violence that we've talked about previously. So it can labelling can lead to that um, working class underachievement because, as I said, they are more likely to be labelled negatively, and that could lead to that self fulfilling prophecy. Remember, there is that negotiation phase, but it can lead to students from working class backgrounds believing that they're not academic, that they're not very good at school and that therefore they are destined to fail. So why try? This also links into our next element of teacher expectations, and that comes with setting and streaming. Now, you'll remember from the roles and processes lecture that when we're talking about setting, we're talking about ability groups for individual subjects, whereas streaming is ability groups across all subjects. So if you're in top set English, you're in top set for all your subjects, where setting means that you can be in different um, ability groups for different subjects, depending on what your ability levels are. Now, the labelling that we've already talked about can lead to um, people, uh, students being put into lower sets and streams if they're not hitting that ideal pupil um, framework or that they're coming across as not as um, able. Now, when we're looking at setting and streaming in terms of um, educational achievement by class, working class students are more likely to be placed in the lower sets and streams. And this can be linked to material deprivation not ha or cultural capital in s or cultural deprivation, sorry, in that they aren't necessarily able to access the curriculum as quickly because they don't have those um, sources of reference when talking about Shakespeare or um, when using examples in class that can lead to um, students not necessarily being able to fully engage with the curriculum so therefore they're deemed to be less able which puts them in lower sets and strains. So as you can see, those, those external factors do interplay with the internal. And um, because working class students are usually placed in lower sets and streams, they, that can lead to lower self-esteem. It can lead to students um, not trying as hard because they're not seen as able. 
And as we said as well, it can also lead to limited opportunities and limited access to opportunities. So actually prove that they can do well or they can improve and do better. Okay. Next up, we've got um, educational triage. And what this means is that students are generally split into three groups. The group that are going to achieve regardless of the support given, the group that um, are not going to achieve no matter how much um, support is given, and then the middle group. The group that if you put your resources here, you can shift a few up from a four to a five or a five to a six, which is obviously what schools are looking to do. So with educational triage, which links into setting and streaming and labelling, teachers and schools, this is often more done at a school based level rather than individual teacher level. They will identify those students, what they call borderline students, and really pull resources and support to those students who would help with the idea that they would then um, achieve slightly higher, perhaps a four moving to a five or a five moving to a six or a C moving to a B. And that means, but because though working class students are more likely to be in the lowest sets and streams, it's likely that they're going to fall into the group of students that are going to fail at anyway, regardless of what um, systems and strategies are put in place. So therefore, they are more likely to underachieve, whereas the middle class are more likely to take up space in the middle group that's going to get the resources or the more higher ability groups who um, don't require additional support. OK, so when the, this whole idea of teacher expectations is looking at those roles and processes that we talked about previously and how they specifically lead to working class underachievement. And mostly that links back to uh, labelling theory and links back to that idea of the ideal pupil. Now, obviously, this is not a perfect um, idea. This is, there's, there's issues with this idea because if we could identify the cause, then we could do then we can fix it. But there's never one specific cause. So with any explanation of um, educational achievement um, by class or any other factor, it, there's never going to be a perfect solution. If there was, we could have um, policies and procedures in place to negate that. So when we're looking at the idea of teacher expectation and the roles and processes in schools which um, lead to working class um, underachievement, we can argue that this theory is overly deterministic. It takes away student agency and the idea that students can have some control over their achievement. They don't have to um, take on the label of underachieving. And this was proven by Margaret Fuller in 1984 and her study into black working class girls in London in a comprehensive who had rejected the label of underachieving and basically turned around and said, you, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to prove you wrong and rejected that label and actually achieved quite highly in their examinations. It also, as a theory, gives a lot of agency to teachers and suggests that teachers will shape the pupil identities and shape the um, label that students are given and therefore affecting their educational um, achievement. And in particular with class, this idea that because teachers generally are from middle class backgrounds, depending on your um, working definition of class, then they are looking at the working class students in a more negative light. And the problem we have um, as well is that setting and streaming can actually support students. So by being lower ability groups can receive more scaffolding, higher ability groups more stretch and more challenge and it can help teachers to really tailor in their teaching to the um, group that's in front of them. With mixed ability groups this can sometimes be lost where you're trying to support the lower end whilst also stretching the more able. 
there's also been changes to teacher training. So teacher training now talks about labelling and talks about unconscious biases and how that can impact and influence educational achievement in a way to try and negate that and make people aware of these issues so that they don't perhaps become as big of an issue in um, education. The next factor we're going to talk about is subcultures. And we've talked previously about the anti-school and pro-school subcultures and what they mean. What we're looking at here is how this links to class. So I'm not going to go into much detail about what an anti-school or pro-school subculture is. You can go back to the lecture on roles and processes in education to, to look at that. But what has been found is that working class students do tend to be more likely to formulate an anti-school subculture because they're not able to achieve status in the same way as middle class students through academic ability, through um, acceptance into wider school activities, things like principals councils, school plays and um, prefect systems and things like that. And um, as we learned with, from Sugarman, the habitat of the working class tends to be more anti-school or not necessarily, I wouldn't say actually anti-school, but tends to be very different to school culture, which leads, lends itself more to um, middle class habitat. So where with schools you have um, the idea of deferred gratification, work hard now and you'll get good grades at the end of year 11 or you'll get good grades at the end of year 13. Working class subcultures tend to be more immediate gratification. They want the status, they want that reward immediately. And that's kind of an antithesis to um, schools, which can lead to students formulating that anti-school subculture because the way that they um, see their behaviour may not be as a bad kid, and very rarely there are bad kids, but there are, uh, it, it just kind of puts them at odds with the um, school culture, which can lead to that anti-school club culture from forming. Whereas the middle classes are more likely to formulate the pro-school subcultures because they are more committed to the school values, and, but they're also more able to engage in the wider life of the school. They're more likely to be able to attend the open events, to do the um, school plays and out extracurricular activities that create that, that create that status for them, because they may not have caring responsibilities at home or part-time jobs as the working class may. But by gaining status through that anti-school subculture, the working class are more likely to underachieve because the way that they gave, gain that status is through things like um, truanting, disruptive behaviour and breaking school rules. Whereas the middle classes who are more pro-school get their status from that academic achievement and from their engagement with the wider school life. Now, the problem with this theory is that not all students join subcultures. Um, the school isn't divided into two parts, those who are pro-school and those who are anti-school. So it doesn't really apply to the majority of working class students. So the trend still shows that they are underachieving, but to say it's because of um, membership to an anti-school subculture kind of ignores the vast majority of working class students because they're not in an anti-school subculture. And remember that Bordeaux, the idea of habitats and the working class habitat seen as anti-school, it's not necessarily the case. Bordeaux never said that working class habitats was less than the middle class habitats, just said it was different. So maybe it, it's an area that schools need to change in creating that kind of symbolic violence against the working class students. Now, our final um, reason for or ex internal factor on um, educational achievement and working class is to do with school policies. 
And we've talked a lot about this, so you may need to go back and again have a look at the lecture on um, education policies and their aims, as well as possibly re-looking at your notes. But in particular, what I'm going to talk about here are marketisation policies. So this idea of creating competition in schools to boost achievements, raise standards, and ultimately to link to educational equality. We've seen that already that these marketisation policies don't necessarily lead to um, these things. And actually, the marketisation policies put the working class at an automatic disadvantage. They don't have free choice in which school they go to. They don't have that open enrolment available to them because there are too many other factors that limit which schools they can go to could be uniform. So again, looking it links into that external in terms of the material deprivation. Um, you've also got because of marketization policies, schools are concerned more with leave tables. So you get that educational triage and schools preferring middle class students who are more likely to fit the frame of an ideal student because they're going to achieve the grades that are going to boost them up from the league tables, which are going to make them look better, which means more students come to that school and funding formula and all that, all that malarkey that we've talked about previously. So these policies that look to create a better education system in some way are immediately kind of disadvantaging the working class um, because they are um, well, I'm just saying, um, disadvantaging the working class because they don't open open enrollment to everybody. They don't create the, the choice that they're supposed to for all students. And again, it's that reflection of the work of the education system being a middle class institution that suggests that this would be. Um, equal for everyone when it's not. However, we do have what are referred to as compensatory education policies. And these are the policies that help to overcome the external factors such as material and cultural deprivation felt by working class students, and also some of the more the internal um, factors which um, can lead to educational underachievement by working class students. So, for example, we can talk about pupil premium, free school meals, but we can also talk about education action zones, which provided more funding for schools in deprived areas, um, educational maintenance grants to allow students post 16 the opportunity to continue in education, whereas previously they may have had to leave in order to get a job and support themselves. We can also see these compensatory educations really clearly recently in with the COVID pandemic, with the um, introduction of laptops for students or internet access for students in order to link into the remote learning programs that were being run, um, as well as things like the, the national tutoring um, program, where schools are able to get tutors for um, disadvantaged students who are perhaps um, a little bit behind in their education due to the COVID lockdown. Now, how long these policies are going to continue, I can't tell you. We don't actually know how long COVID is going to continue on, hopefully not that much longer. But um, the, these compensatory education policies are a way to support working class students so that they are able to achieve all that they're capable of. OK, so what we can see is that these internal processes that we've already talked about in terms of roles and processes can um, negatively impact educational achievement for the working classes because because the education system is a middle class institution and it's built by the middle class, ultimately for the middle class. But things are changing now, whether or not it's the internal factors or the external factors which have the greater influence, that's up to you to decide.